All right, welcome in. Late Kick is live. It is Tuesday night, December 7th, year of our Lord, 2021. Jam-packed. I mean, we're loaded. I don't know what's beyond jam-packed, but we're jam-loaded tonight. High atop downtown Nashville, Tennessee. To give you a preview, we have an evening of outrage on tap. We have, unfortunately, another evening of atonement on tap. Miami fans, I told you we wouldn't run. We're not running. No, we are going to meet the obstacle that has been my predictions for Mario Cristobal in the past head on tonight. And we'll do it in just a matter of minutes. The entire game really changing before our eyes in the state of Florida. And I'm not just talking about Miami, although I am chiefly talking about Miami, but we got Napier in the house at Florida. Now, obviously Mike Norvell got a little bit of a head start at Florida State. Here's the question. What is it all going to mean? What does it all mean for Florida recruiting Florida, the state of, uh, as you know, I've told you many times, I think that is the key. That's the gateway to that illusion of balance competitively at the top of college football. It's not NIL. It's not the transfer portal. It's not your precious expanded playoff. It is evening out and keeping home the elite talent in the state of Florida. They haven't done it to a historical degree over the last few years. We'll give you some numbers later, but uh, we're going to talk about it tonight. Mario to Miami, of course, we're going to talk about uh, he left Oregon. We got to give you the very latest on the Oregon coaching search. The transfer portal, even in the last 20 minutes, has been on fire. Max Johnson, the LSU quarterback, is in the transfer portal now. That wasn't the case when I got to the office today. So we got to keep updating. If you go to 247sports.com, you got to keep updating that transfer portal. We got Quinn Ewers in there, Eli Ricks. Uh, Jaden Hazelwood's gone to Arkansas already, so we've got a lot to discuss there. And the Heisman Trophy finalists that came out last night. It came out about 10 minutes before I recorded this morning's Late Kick Extra podcast. So you've already gotten just a little sneak preview of how I feel about that. But boy, I did not empty the barrel. So we have a little bit more to discuss on that front tonight. Remember to be following on Twitter at Late Kick Josh. We've got Christmas coming up. Obviously, a lot of you are going to be traveling. You're going to be on vacation. Uh, we're going to be traveling. And so I want to let you know a couple of things that are coming. Number one, I'll be down in Fort Lauderdale next Wednesday for the National Signing Day show. I'll be down there. Most of our team will be down there. And so we'll be doing a live show from Fort Lauderdale. More details to come. It'll be both on CBS Sports HQ as well as the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. So that's coming. And some things that I can't quite reveal to you yet are coming. But I am just trying to remind you that just because we have bowl games a couple of weeks away and you think there's nothing going on right now, there's a lot going on. So keep it locked on Twitter, at Late Kick Josh. That's where you will be updated. And of course, we're not slowing down on content production either way. So let's dive into this tonight. I didn't want to lead with this. I'll be real with you, but we have to. We have to lead tonight with the wet bag of trash that was the Heisman Trophy finalist list that was released yesterday evening, right before I was going to record this morning's Late Kick Extra podcast. And I figured, you know what, I got a little bit of it out of the way this morning, but it's not all out of my system because I got angrier and angrier. And generally, this is a happy, carefree sort of show. We don't focus on the negatives. We focus on the positives. But when they take a big negative pie and they just shove it right in your face, we have no choice but to talk about it. I want to reiterate, this is a travesty. I use that word about twice a year when it comes to sports, but this is a travesty. I feel bad for Will Anderson. I feel bad for Kenneth Walker. You're looking at the finalists on your screen right now. Bryce Young's going to win this thing by a country mile. Who's going to win it is not up for debate. Who should have gone to New York City very much is. Aiden Hutchinson got nothing against the kid, and I want to say that right up front because you may think with the very, very spirited case I'm about to make for Will Anderson, it sounds like I'm doing it um, kind of at the expense of Aiden Hutchinson. No, 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 no. Both of them should be there. You got C.J. Stroud there, Kenny Pickett there. So there is no Will Anderson on this list. Uh, that is a complete shaft job. There is no Kenneth Walker III on that list. Complete shaft job. To be clear, both of them should be there. And if you need to remove someone, like Trey Scott asked earlier today, I would be happy removing C.J. Stroud for Kenneth Walker. I don't need to remove anyone for Will Anderson. He's better than all of them. I'd vote him over any of them. Although Bryce Young's going to win this thing, I'd vote him over any of them. So this is pathetic, is what it was. I want to dive into this, though. Because everyone, well, not everyone, I should scratch that. A lot of people last night had outrage about this. But I started to realize as I was scrolling through the reactions out there, a lot of people were angry like I was, but some of you were asking the wrong question. Because I kept looking, got the magnifying glass out, and I realized some of you were asking, how can people who watch college football not vote Will Anderson a Heisman finalist? How can people who watch college football not vote Kenneth Walker? Well, there's your mistake. You made the wrong assumption. 
you assume all these voters are watching college football. There aren't. There aren't. I've tried to explain this before. I guess this is the perfect encapsulation of what I've tried to tell you. Not everyone who covers this sport is passionate about this sport. Not everyone who covers this sport loves this sport. And as a result, not everyone who has a vote in this thing really even watches a whole lot of college football. You find that so hard to believe, don't you? You find it hard to believe because you love it. I love it. I mean, I watch dozens and dozens of hours of it per week, just like you do. And you assume that if you do that, and you know, you work on a construction site in Selma, Alabama five days a week, and this is your respite, this is your reward. If you view it through those lenses, you assume that these guys and girls that get paid to cover what I love, surely they're passionate about it, right? A lot of them are. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. There are a lot of folks who vote on this thing that really eat, sleep, and breathe college football, kind of like you and I do. But there are others who don't. There are a lot of beat writers who cover their team and then also take the time to watch the rest of the sport. And that's a full-time job. Being a beat reporter, whether you appreciate it or not, is a full-time job. And there are some really good ones who cover a myriad of different programs, and they also take the time to watch the rest of the sport. There are other ones who cover their beat, which is their job, and they don't take the time to watch anyone else. I mean, I can tell you right now, I was looking in my DMs last night when the Heisman finalist list came out, and I was really outspoken about it really quickly. I had people reach out to me. I want you to consider what I'm about to say. I had people reach out to me, and they said, I'm a Heisman voter, but if we're being real, I probably shouldn't be. I'm not giving you names for obvious reasons. There were more than one. There was more than one. Who said that? Uh, then there were others who reached out and agreed and said, I take this process seriously. I wish more people did, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but the thing that I want to circle back to again is it's not the award I have the problem with. It's the process. It's the voting process that I have a problem with. And I'm arguing about a very specific group here. You know the group I'm talking about. I have uh, kind of told you before, when I go to games, I like to be on the field. I don't like to be in the press box so much, aside from food. Uh, one reason is because I just like it on the field more. I think it's a better experience. Uh, it's not a better view, but it's a better experience. But number two, it's because I have some of these folks I don't really want to be around all that much. And it really heavily overlaps with the same crowd that tried to cancel the sport uh, a little over a year ago, last year. Uh, those are the folks who probably aren't emotionally invested in this thing to the degree that you really should be to be a Heisman voter. And so the process is the joke. It's not the award. I love the, I revere the award and a lot of the guys who have won it, but I don't have a problem with guys like Aiden Hutchinson. I do have a problem with anyone who would be outspoken saying that he belongs in this over, let's say a guy like Will Anderson or, uh, Conversely, anyone who would argue that there is a limit on the number of defensive players who should be involved in this. But Will Anderson, Kenneth Walker, I mean, you're talking about two studs. Saw them both multiple times in person this year, two studs. Jesse is showing you right now, before we move on, if you're watching on YouTube, the comparative statistical analysis between Hutchinson and Anderson. I want you to look at that. I mean, those are wide gaps. 91 to 58 tackles, 52 to 33 solo tackles. How about tackles for loss? Anderson more than doubled Hutchinson up. I want to pause again and tell you, Aiden Hutchinson deserves to be there. I'm just trying to show you how emphatically Will Anderson does too. And he's got the edge on sacks too. And I had someone reach out to me and they threw, <laughs> I laugh because it's a joke. They threw the PFF grade in my face for Aiden Hutchinson, quarterback pressures. And he said, essentially he questioned my intelligence and said, I guess you didn't really see the whole story. Shame on you for being fooled by these low-hanging fruit statistics. What about Hutchinson's PFF grade for quarterback pressures? It's very impressive. This is why for the third time, I'm telling you, I'm not taking away from Aiden Hutchinson. I do want to remind you of something though, friend. This is not apples to apples. Will Anderson, you flip on an Alabama game randomly in the third quarter, you know what you can find him doing? You could find him sacking a quarterback. You could find him executing a bull rush technique on a right tackle, but here's something else you found, number 31 in Crimson, doing a lot this year. Covering. He dropped back in coverage. You don't get a whole lot of quarterback pressures when you drop back in coverage. So um, there is maybe some intelligence that needs to be questioned there, or I don't want to call people stupid. Maybe there's just some more research that needs to be done. But if you're voting on this thing, got a lot of papers here. If you're voting on this thing, and I kind of put this as part of my platform for my future college football commissioner campaign. I have a very simple college football literacy test 
that I think each and every person should be able to pass with at least a B grade every year if you want to maintain your Heisman voter status. Because to be honest, if you can't tell me basic things about the sport, and if you don't really watch the sport, you don't have any business voting for awards in the sport. I don't think that's a very radical campaign, uh, bullet point, if you will. So I got worked up about that last night. I said, a lot of people in movies say, I said they would never make me cry. I said I would never let them get me worked up about the Heisman. Sure enough, I got worked up about the Heisman. I was mad guy on the internet about the Heisman last night. So uh, initially, I had a problem, but ultimately I realized the same guy is gonna win it, so it's really semantics, let's move on. We probably already spent too much of our emotion on it as it is. Here's some good news. I get to my apartment today after I went to the gym and I go in the mail room and I had first off a lot of packages that FedEx had not registered so that's that's a beef that I have with FedEx but that's not for the show what's for the show is I had one of those envelopes again normally if I get an envelope from our friends at Academy Sports and Outdoors it's in person but now we've advanced past the in-person handoff now we're shipping those Academy gift cards. And so there it is right there in the oversized package room because that's how many they sent me. I have a fresh batch of Academy gift cards ready for the holidays and ready for trips to either, we have not figured this out yet, either Miami for the Orange Bowl or Dallas for the Cotton Bowl. Those are both the semifinal games, obviously. And then, yes, we will be in Indianapolis. I don't know of any other big game on National Championship Week that will keep us from going and visiting Steve Wiltfong country, Indianapolis, Indiana, but Academy Sports and Outdoors, if you don't already know, let me just remind you one more time. It quite literally could be your one-stop shop. Now, if you want some fragrance or maybe, you know, you want something very specific like a truck, I don't think they have that at Academy, but short of that, they have everything else you need. So Academy Sports and Outdoors is the hookup. Now, if you're living in Tucson, Arizona, or here we go, Pocatello, it's been a while, Pocatello, Idaho, or Pocatella for the female version, and you don't have one in your backyard, it's okay, because academy.com is there. And it's, it's even easier to say academy.com than it is to say Academy Sports and Outdoors. But however you say it, however you access it, just make sure you give them a look before you finish crossing off all of those lists on the Christmas to-do, because they have got what you need, Academy Sports and Outdoors. Uh, this is gonna be tough for me, so that's why I'm dragging my feet getting into the segment. Oh, so... Jesse, we didn't even bring Kleenexes. It takes a big man to admit his mistake, and I am that big man. That's a Michael Scott quote, but it so accurately describes where my head is at right now and where my heart is at. And my heart is on my sleeve because we screwed up. Boy, did we screw up. And we didn't. When we, when we do something bad, it's a me. I screwed up. I did some talking about two months ago about the Miami job that looked like it was gonna come open. And I was talking about their dream candidate, who I thought was a very, very long shot, if not an impossible shot at the time. And his name was one Mario Cristobal. He was the head coach at Oregon. Things were rolling up there. They were the favorite to win the Pac-12. And I just thought there was infrastructure in place there and lack of it at Miami that would make it completely insane for him to go from Eugene to Coral Gables. And um, we were wrong. So the other night, we wrapped up the show. And then the news broke. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, you're seeing a tweet that I put out. I had it all ready to go. And um, it says, I was wrong. You were right. Welcome home, Mario. And I addressed it to all of Kane Twitter and all Miami fans. I put it out on all the social platforms. And I just want to tell you, this is where I want some credit. A lesser man would probably settle for just putting this tweet out, but it takes a much bigger man to admit a mistake of this magnitude, and I have to be that bigger man tonight. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give each and every Miami Hurricane fan exactly what you deserve, and that is me sitting here and having a giant triple stack plate of crow in front of me, and by that, of course, I mean watching every second of this video. Roll it if you must, Colin. You gotta be a better job than Oregon. That's the domino that needs to fall. And you may look back and you may say, what did he just say? Miami's gotta be a better job than Oregon. Yeah, that's what I said. Because to be clear, Miami's not a better job than Oregon. 
When you hear people say things like, money's not going to be an issue, or you hear people say things like, oh, we're ready to spend. First off, it's easy to say. It's a lot harder to do. Secondly, when they say that, they usually mean we're going to be able to match a coach's salary. That's not what you have to match. You got to match Nike's salary. That's what you have to match. And I'm telling you, Miami will not do it. I don't know if they're capable. They got a bunch of zeros on the end of the health fund down there. I'm telling you, I don't think they'll be able to do it. Well, breaking news, they did it. You did it. And so again, from me to you, I was wrong. You were right. I'm stupid. You're smart. Um, you are attractive. I'm not that good looking. Everything that needs to be said towards our Miami constituency tonight. I know you've waited for it. I see you drooling right now. I see the foam coming out of the mouth. And it should be because you got the job done. And so now, hopefully, with that behind us, gone but not forgotten, we got to get down to business. I mean, what does this really mean? This is huge. Obviously, I didn't expect it to happen. It's huge. I think when you look back now over several weeks slash months, really, uh, even Miami Hurricane fans know this now. There was reason, if you were just judging by the past, to doubt that Miami could get this done. Because if you were to apply the past, what Miami has been in recent history, to the present, there was no way that Mario Cristobal was coming down here, even if it is home for him. Uh, but that's where the tune changes. Because what had to change is the story here. I think I had a reason to initially doubt, just judging on you know recent history. And so things did change. And that means it's a new day there. And you look at Manny Diaz now, and you, you look at what he was and wasn't able to accomplish. And Manny Diaz, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, with the way they handled him, maybe he'll just quit. You never quit. If you got a buyout in your contract, you never quit, friends. It'll be over. The pain will subside. The buyout money does not. It takes a long time to work through the kind of money that Manny Diaz has coming to him. But I want to be clear about this. It, it's a new day. A lot of people say that when you get a new head coach. So I want to be very clear. It's not a new day because Mario Cristobal came home. It's a new day because of what had to be in place to bring Mario Cristobal home. Mario Cristobal was not coming home for what Miami had been. He's coming home for what Miami can be. And I can assure you they had to check every one of those boxes and assure him of it before he was ever able to sign on that dotted line. They have, he did, and it is a maximum investment in football. To be clear, that's what we're talking about here. It isn't one man. True enough, you hire one man. It's not one man. It's given the right man all the tools to build a machine. Alabama's a machine led by Nick Saban. Ohio State football, it's a machine led by Ryan Day. Miami football has to be a machine. And hopefully, Mario Cristobal is the kind of guy to build and then run that machine. But I'm telling you, this is a new day. And make no mistake, it's got a lot of folks down there nervous, as it should. But to be clear, when you build that machine, it's not just hiring the right defensive line coach. You know, everyone can say recruiting. It's so much deeper than that. It's sports science. Obviously, it's nutrition. It's the psychological aspect. It's understanding how to harness marketing at this level. It's understanding how to win with NIL. It's understanding how to leverage the transfer portal. But also, it's understanding how to make people know again. When you drive down I-95 to recruit in South Florida, you got a war on your hands. You hadn't had that feeling in a long time. There have been a lot of folks, not even from that state, driving down I-95 to Broward and to Dade and American Heritage, all those high schools down there, and understanding that, yeah, Miami's down here, but they're not really down here. They're there now. I can assure you, if nothing else is clear to you, Miami's there now, and you'll have a war on your hands. You may still pluck one every now and then, but you're going to have to knife fight, and you're going to have to knife fight the actual program in the backyard down there to do it. I've, I've, it's been a long time. I'm kind of excited to say it. It's been a long time since you've been able to say that. But I want you to now think about sort of the reset button in the state of Florida. I'm going to talk about this more in just a second uh, in a different segment. But, man, it, it's always been one of my go-tos to kind of gauge how your opponents, how your rivals feel about a hire. Always believed in this. It's not the end-all, be-all. But I've always been a big believer in gauging how effective the hire was 
by how your rivals feel about it. And I can assure you, they do not feel as comfortable talking about Miami today in Gainesville, Florida, or Tallahassee, Florida, as they did this time last week. And so that alone is worth a certain bit of solace if you're a Miami fan. But to know that when either of those programs, or Clemson or Bama or Ohio State, when they start to drive or head down to South Florida, knowing they got a handful in terms of recruiting, that's also something that makes you sleep well when you go to bed tonight. But man, I mean, it's been a while. It's been a while since we could say that. So now here's what I want to do. I want to transition a little bit. and It's kind of got the same theme, but now I'm going to talk about something that's not just Miami. This is all of college football. And I want to be very, very clear about why it's all of college football. It's going to sound like I'm just talking about three programs. I'm not. If you're Cincy, if you're Michigan, you know, you, you two have college football playoff semifinal games coming up. I'll tell you why this means something to you. Colin, here's your end point. The entire dynamic in the state of Florida is shifting in recruiting, and it's been a long time, and it's about time that we had the chance to say that. As I have said for months and months and months, ever since I came to 24-7 and I've done a segment about this, the key to competitive balance at the top, top, top of college football is not the NIL or transfer portal. It's not college football playoff expansion. It is the evening out and the keeping home of talent in the state of Florida. Unless you do that, then no amount of playoff expansion is going to change the fact that the same few teams seem to be dominating every year. And so we've got new coaches all over the place. Mike Norvell's got a little bit of a head start at Florida State, but we've got Billy Napier and his staff coming in in Gainesville, and we've now got Mario Cristobal coming in the door at Miami. Let's quickly review just how violent the situation has been on the recruiting trail in Florida. I tweeted this stat out earlier. We talked about this back in July. Uh, but I know we have a ton of new listeners and viewers since then. This is how bad it's been. This is a stat that boggles the mind. Since 2016, the University of Alabama alone has pulled more five-star players out of the state of Florida than Florida State, Florida, and Miami combined. If you want to know why Bama dominates, if you want to know why there's a lack of that parity that you want so bad at the top of the sport, it has nothing to do with the size of the playoff. It has nothing to do with the NIL structure here and the transfer portal moves there. It is getting talent out of Florida and to a somewhat equal degree. Texas not holding up their end of the bargain in the Lone Star State and USC not holding up their end of the bargain. Well, look what we have now. We got big NIL moves happening at Texas. We got Lincoln Riley and his staff coming in the door at USC. So you figure to have an uptick at both of those programs in recruiting, but now we feel confident. I th at least I think there's reason to feel confident that recruiting is about to take a step up, at the very least one or two notches up at Florida. Certainly that's already underway at Florida State and it is about to tenfold increase in significance at Miami. How radically will it change? Well, this is where I want to talk about the Sunshine State scorecard. I think we just showed one of the graphics, but Bud Elliott puts this thing out every so often, and all it is is a measure of how much of your four- and five-star in-state talent you keep at home. Last cycle, the 2021 recruiting cycle, 37% of four- and five-star talent in the state of Florida went to a school in Florida. It's the second lowest figure it's ever been, and that is directly correlated to number one, underachievement for the big three in the state of Florida. But if you have been watching the college football playoff as of late, not just this year, last several years, you've seen the big boys that make it to the finish line are doing it with Florida talent littered all over their roster. It would make me sick. If I were a Miami fan or a Florida fan or an FSU fan, it would make me sick. And I know it does. So I'm not trying to put words in their mouth. But Napier, the focus right now at Florida is on the staff. It's a very incomplete picture of what his recruiting staff is going to be because we don't know what his staff's going to be. Mike Norvell and Florida State have taken recruiting very seriously. And what they need, here's my focus for them. My focus with Napier at Florida is on putting his staff together so then we get a sense of how well they'll recruit. My focus for Norvell and Florida State is popping a product in 2022. By that I mean putting up a record that is convincing enough to make that kind of talent stay home. Because right now, the data is kind of still incomplete on that. They're trying to sell vision. They need to sell vision, and they need to package it up with a very, very promising record on the field in 2022. Cristobal at Miami, I don't really care. He's going to get it done either way. He's an assassin in recruiting. That is an equal to or better than shot 
at meeting what you have been doing in recruiting for all three programs now moving forward. I would venture to guess that 37% sunshine scorecard rate ups itself to 55 or 60% over the next two to three recruiting cycles. Now that's a pretty drastic uptick, but I think it's warranted to think in those terms. The entire country should be tuned into this though. I'm telling you, you don't think it matters to you if you're Utah, or let me use the two programs I mentioned when we started this. If you're a Michigan fan or a Cincinnati fan, you may listen to me talking about the Sunshine State scorecard and how much four and five star talent stays home in the state of Florida. And you may think, what does this matter to me? Here's what it matters. One of you is going to play Georgia and one of you is going to play Alabama in semifinal games on New Year's Eve. They are favored against you and they will out-athlete you. Doesn't mean they'll beat you, but they'll be favored and out-athlete you due in large part to talent that they've gotten out of that state. And so I want you to look at these rosters when you play them. And I want you to look at the kind of speed they have on the field, especially on the perimeter. And I want you to think in any given year, if I were to just take one of those racehorse receivers, or one of those lockdown defenders away, or one of those five-star premier left tackles, if I just took one of them away, much less two or three per roster, it could actually change the outcome of a game. That's how big this is. So if you're Michigan, you may not be landing the kid, but just the mere fact that Georgia may land one or two less could indirectly impact your ability to win a national championship. It matters for all of college football. And I don't think it's talked about enough because I don't, I think it's been so long since those programs recruited at the level they should that it's almost just taken for granted that they don't recruit down there anymore. Well, they will at Miami and they're doing a pretty darn good job of it at FSU right now. I hope to be able to say the same thing about Florida. So you couple that with what Texas is trying to do in NIL and certainly what they can do just in general in recruiting and what Lincoln Riley figures to be able to do in Southern California. You have in-state talent staying home more often in Texas, California, and Florida. That is a huge shift over time in the overall landscape at the top and mid-tier of college football. I'll tell you what else matters. We haven't been able to talk about it in about a month now because it's been so busy. The transfer portal's on fire. I mean, the transfer portal should be the number one story in college football right now. The problem is they haven't made me commissioner yet. Therefore, we have not been able to implement our brand new idea for a college football calendar. And so unfortunately right now, you're having to focus on actual games on the field and then also coaching searches and then early signing day coming up and the transfer portal all at the same time. And under our format that I think we're gonna go ahead and put out there Thursday, wrote, write that in pencil, that I think we're gonna put out there Thursday uh, we will take care of all this. But until then, we got to talk about all of it in this jumbled mess right in mid-December. Huge names floating out there right now. Uh, the biggest of which is obviously Quinn Ewers. That was the number one overall player in the past cycle, number one quarterback. And he goes to Ohio State. Forgoes his senior year in high school, might I add, and goes to Ohio State. He's already out. He's in the transfer portal. And now we got to know where he's going to go. Now, Texas was the just presumed favorite to land him. And maybe if we're putting odds out there, they still are. But there is a lot of smoke around Texas Tech. They got a new coaching staff in there. Uh, they have promised him the world in terms of production and in terms of being able to put up, you know, miles and miles of offensive yardage. And they're right about that. He would. Uh, it's kind of a, a weird headline. Top overall quarterback in the country, possibly linked with Texas Tech. Uh, but, you know, a lot of folks out there love that. Uh, a lot of other folks out there look at it and say, what are you doing? I don't really care either way. I'm just here to tell you what's going on. Uh, but I would pay attention very closely in the coming days to that because that is, and I cannot overstate this enough, that is a massive puzzle piece out there to the future national championship picture that's just floating. And if, if Sark lands him, and to be clear, Texas has a clearer path to starting at quarterback than Texas Tech does, as crazy as that sounds. If Sark lands him, I mean, how many people all of a sudden go, uh-oh. It was like this year, they had revolving door, merry-go-round, I guess, at quarterback. And then if you land Quinn Ewers, he's going to start. Now you got Casey Thompson and Hudson Card still there. He's going to start. Uh, he's probably not going there if he isn't pretty sure he's going to start. This is a huge story. This is a monumental story because that guy, from a skill set, just from a raw skill set alone, is like few that you've ever seen play this game. Now, it takes more than that to play the game, but raw skill set is is through the roof. What about Jaden Hazelwood? This is a guy who is no longer in the transfer portal. Jaden Hazelwood has already landed. 
This is a former high four star, five star kind of receiver, depending on where you're looking. And um, we work at 24 seven, so that's where we look. I, I'm so used to saying that back in my radio days because I wanted to be equal. We're not equal anymore. Uh, we, have, we play favorites here. Jaden Hazelwood was from Georgia. He went to Oklahoma. And now he entered the transfer portal and he has landed at Arkansas. And this was the number one overall wide receiver prospect in the 2019 recruiting cycle. This is large, obviously, for Sam Pittman just on the surface, but when you also consider that a guy by the name of Traylon Burks has to be replaced, and he was an alpha stud type at receiver this year for them, one game, I mean, I think he won the Texas A&M game for him. He was huge all year long. Jaden Hazelwood comes in at the perfect time, but this is what also you need to watch more and more of. Obviously, if you have a coaching change, then there's a lot that could be in play. But let's pretend for a second that we're not just talking about a program that had a coaching change and therefore some of their players wanted to move on. Think about what Bama's doing this year. On both sides of this coin, Alabama benefits from Ohio State having a crowded wide receiver room and they get arguably the best wide receiver in the country this year in Jamison Williams. That wouldn't have happened if Ohio State wasn't as loaded as they were. But then the other side of the coin, Alabama has found themselves in dire straits down the stretch at running back. Well, why? Because Keelan Robinson's not there anymore. Because a crowded running back room led to Keelan Robinson, who was a high four-star talent in his own right from the previous cycle, leaving and going to Texas. Well, then a bunch of injuries happen, and all of a sudden, you don't have any depth there. Even though, if you're just remembering recruiting from the past couple of cycles, you think, Bama's taken like 100 running backs. Yeah, they didn't all stay. Ohio State's taking like 100 receivers. Yeah, they didn't all stay. And programs like Arkansas are going to be able to benefit from that if they know how to leverage this thing properly. So this is big for Arkansas. Now, you talk about big in the last hour. Two names, one of them, I guess, in the last hour popped. Max Johnson has entered the transfer portal. That was the starting quarterback for LSU this year. Has entered the transfer portal. Now, it's not official until they land somewhere else. So theoretically, he could come out of the transfer portal and stay at LSU, uh, stands to reason he probably intends to leave. That's normally what you mean to do when you enter the portal. I'm not sure what to make of this. I do know that, obviously, you got a new coaching staff down there, and if you're Brian Kelly, you want to find the right kind of system fits. You also don't know if Brian Kelly has his eyes on high-profile quarterbacks in the transfer portal. Now, I'm not trying to float rumors because I don't know anything firsthand. I'm just saying... The transfer portal is not a picture that you try and figure out as it's going on. Uh, this happened with Georgia this time last year. It looked like they were going to be gutted in the secondary. And then all of a sudden, by the time they got to the season, they had made two big acquisitions in the portal. And all of a sudden, everything looked right. And it could be the same way with LSU. I know it looks like the world's burning and it's just Hindenburg college football style right now. Let's let the whole cycle play out and then we'll judge it. So, uh, Max Johnson, this is just in the last hour this has happened, so obviously there's not a whole lot of reaction there. But Eli Ricks has been in there for a couple of days. Eli Ricks was the number two ranked corner prospect in 2020. He is the top rated corner prospect in the transfer portal right now. Now here's what's interesting, and here's why I'm talking about him. Ohio State looked to be possibly the destination for him. And then all of a sudden we get Chris Hummer right here at 24-7 today reporting that Ohio State's out of it. Unless something changes, they're out of it. What most people took that to mean is they don't want to mess their current recruiting class up by bringing Ricks in, which could then cause some decommitments, et cetera, et cetera, which is always the fine balance that you have to strike. All the major programs have to do this. How do we balance the talent we could get out of the portal with early signing day coming up? And that not only is a factor here with Ricks, but also it's a factor with all these guys. You want to take one or two of them, but at the same time, you don't want to take him at the expense of disrupting a very, very good recruiting class about a week before the early signing day. So you got to be careful there. Eli Ricks, though, you've still got Georgia in this. Alabama is heavily in this. Uh, USC is in this. It all circles back to the right fit. He's got to want to go there. And also, you got to have room for him. Uh, the last name I wanted to touch on is Zach Evans. Zach Evans is a seven yards per carry guy, a couple of years in now at TCU. Uh, former five-star running back. Remember, all the talk was about how talented he was on the field and how questionable he was off the field. Well, you got two years of college sample size now, and so you 
kind of know what you're dealing with. At least you would hope you do. And so Tennessee's in this. Ole Miss is in this. He's already taken a visit to Ole Miss. I would assume that Ole Miss is the betting favorite right now. Really interested if Tennessee gets him on campus this weekend, which it looks like they will, if Josh Heupel and Tennessee can work their magic. Uh, this is going to be a really, really big pickup. Whoever gets him, it's going to be a very, very big pickup. The transfer portal is on fire right now. It's just getting started. Remember, we have multiple waves of this. We have it last year, had it last year. We'll have it again this year. And also, it's not settled when we go into spring. A lot of guys are waiting to go through spring practice before they make their ultimate portal decision. So we'll have another wave of them come out after spring ball. This is truly a year-round sport right now, and you got to cover it as such. There you see the top 10 players right now in the portal. You got some you got some quarterbacks out there. I mean, Spencer Rattler is in the portal. I didn't even talk about him. That's how loaded it is right now. Jameer Gibbs, the running back from Georgia Tech, is a phenomenal back. If Alabama's got room for him, he's going to Bama. I don't know what the latest situation there is, and I don't have time to call Tim Watts on the air because, um, quite frankly, I can't let you hear what he's like in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me. So let's move on here. Uh, we got one more thing that we have to hit on. I saved it for last only because I was, I was waiting on any potential news to come in. And I'm checking the eye, Josh, and I don't see. I see my sister asking for my address, but I do not see. All right, so we're, we're as up to date as we can be on this. The Oregon head coaching search, obviously, by the statements that came out of my mouth over the last couple of months, not something I thought we'd be talking about, but we are talking about it. Oregon needs a head coach. Now, I had someone ask me earlier today, they said, should I consider the fact that Willie Taggart and Mario Cristobal have both left for Florida schools in the past few years as an indication that maybe the Oregon job is not that good? Let me answer that. No. That does not mean the Oregon job is not good at all. There were special factors in play in both instances. Here's the special factor that was in play with Willie Taggart. No one really wanted him to stay. So if anything, instead of laying down on the driveway behind his car, they were pushing his car down the driveway. Uh, that is not a guy they fought to keep at Oregon. And with Mario Cristobal, you had the unique factor of Miami and the allure of being back home being too much for you to overcome. My point there is not to discount that it happened. My point is if you had, uh, let's call it a generic coach. Let's say Dave Aranda was at Oregon, who himself is on a lot of the hot boards. Let's say Dave Aranda was at Oregon. Dave Aranda did not play at Oregon, nor did he play at Miami. I don't think Aranda would have left Oregon for Miami. Cristobal did, but that's because there were special factors in play. So what I'm saying is, I don't think Oregon should be feeling terrible about itself. What I do think Oregon should be doing before they start compiling a list of candidates is defining what makes the Oregon football coach. Like, what is Oregon football? See, o Oklahoma had this stuff figured out. Oklahoma had no question where they wanted to go and the kind of coach they wanted to hire. That's because if you ask the folks at Oklahoma, you ask 10 different folks there, what is Oklahoma football? They'd all name the same critical traits and characteristics. Can I do that at Oregon? If I can, then go ahead and make your list. But I'm just, I'm kind of trying to be cautious in that we've had two instances now where, yeah, guys have left. Maybe one of them we didn't mind seeing go. The other one, it breaks our heart to see go. So what kind of guy are we looking for? Do we need a guy who's from the Pacific Northwest? Do we care about the style of play? Do we care which side of the ball he specializes on? There's a lot of Chip Kelly smoke here. And I am a believer that if they offer Chip Kelly the job, he's taking the job. I think that we got to go back to what's happened in the past. Chip Kelly, of course, was once the Oregon head coach. He's now at UCLA, but he also left you before. Does that matter? Can you blame a guy for taking an NFL head coaching job over Oregon? Does that matter to you? I'm asking very open-ended questions here because I'm not in Oregon. I don't have investment in the program, but you guys do. And so the AD there, Phil Knight, which are really two of the, the most important names in this whole thing, they've got to figure that out. Um, I will say this, though, about Chip Kelly. The other question in the room, aside from are we mad that he left us one time, the other question in the room is does he still have the same edge on college football that he had a generation ago? I don't know that the answer is yes to that. And so basically what we're looking for is we're looking for someone to come up here and we're looking for someone to fully leverage all the resources that Oregon has to offer. Oregon's a much better job now than it was when Kelly was there, first off. 
Uh, there is beyond maximum investment in football, NIL facilities, everything and the like. But you've got to have a guy who is willing to leverage all that through recruiting. That was Mario Cristobal. So they don't want the recruiting to slow down there. They don't want the they, they don't want the brand out there that is Oregon recruiting. They don't want that to slow down. I don't know if Chip Kelly's the guy who delivers that for you. I, I know unequivocally Lane Kiffin would. I don't know how seriously anyone's taking him at Oregon as a candidate. I had Jesse compiling the odds, because yes, there are odds out there right now for who will be the next Oregon head coach. And it was Chip Kelly, I think, is the odds-on favorite. And it was, I don't think Kiffin was even on there. Justin Wilcox is the name who's on there. There you go. Kalani Sataki is at BYU. Brigham Young, because I can't say the Y. He's on there. Uh, you got Brian Harson. How about that? Sneaky. Brian Harson at Auburn right now. Plus 700. Uh, Chris Peterson's on there. Matt Campbell. Dave Aranda. I would be surprised if Aranda moved at this point. But I am not, I'm, I'm speaking so timidly for the rest of this coaching search and coaching carousel cycle. I am, I am scarred, I am wounded, the wound is fresh, and the Band-Aid just keeps getting peeled off. So I'm almost, if I make a prediction, I'm gonna whisper it. But um, they've got to create a culture, and I wanna end on this, cause this is a serious point. If they were to bring Kiffin in, for example, or whoever they bring in, if they bring in a guy who they aren't totally sure is there for 10 years, that's okay. You can bring in a guy, because to get a big fish, a lot of times you have to take that risk. I think they have to put a premium emphasis on creating the same kind of assistant coach culture that Notre Dame ended up having last year with Marcus Freeman in the house. And what I mean by that is hire the kind of assistant coaches and then groom them in such a manner that you are grooming your future head coaches. Notre Dame had their future head coach already in-house last year. When Urban Meyer was at Ohio State in the latter portion of his tenure, he already had the future head coach for Ohio State in the house in Ryan Day. That is what Oregon needs to put a premium emphasis on. They need to hire a guy, but then they need to develop from within so that in the future they can rightfully and responsibly promote from within. Instead of having to go coast to coast and trying to lure someone to Eugene, Oregon, don't take a risk already have sure things in house or as close to a sure thing as you can get. I think there'll be several more names obviously popping up here. Um, I, I really think they thought they'd be able to keep Cristobal home. So even though those rumors have persisted for a little while, I don't know how far down the road they were in this whole process. I wasn't, I can tell you that, so I don't blame Morgan. Uh, thank you so much if you're watching live right now. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. I know we had, we had some technical issues with the YouTube version of the last show. It was one of those deals, just a little inside baseball. This is boring, I won't spend more than 10 seconds on it, but after the show, I go in and I chop off that countdown we do if you watch live, so that people watching the replay don't have to sit through 10 minutes. And YouTube's processing messed us up the other day. It shaved the video off, but it kept the, the extended version of the audio, and so it was all out of sync and out of whack. Some of you had it work on mobile, others of you didn't have it work on desktop and vice versa. So. When that happens, I appreciate you pointing it out to me because sometimes I don't know it's happening. Uh, but then you also have to have me tell you, there's nothing we can do about it. So I'm sorry. YouTube's not going to apologize to you, so I will. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you are following on the social channels at Late Kick Josh. I can't stress that enough. I will be popping up with a familiar name elsewhere in the college football space tomorrow. So among other reasons, you'll want to be following on Twitter and Instagram for that. I've got to get out of here for producer Jesse Ford, director Colin, and the entire crew here. I'm Josh Pate. Have yourselves a great rest of your evening, and God bless.